So some of you are probably asking, where do I start on this thing? Yes, we're going to take it out of the case. We're going to carefully take all of the cards out and start the cleaning process. Of course, that's going to happen. Some of you will be tempted to try to plug your unit in. And uh, this is a 40, 45 year old transmitter. So you have to consider that the components that are in here are from the late 60s to around the 1970 time frame. And uh, you're, you're not going to want to plug something in. You don't even want to bring this up on a Variac, really, until you've done some basic checks. And, uh, you know, the smoke that can occur and the damage could actually influence the power transformer. You do not want to blow your power transformer in the FT-101 or the Kenwood TS-520, for that matter. There's a little issue with the back plug, the Jones connector where power comes in. Both the DC and the AC power come in a multi-pin Jones connector, which is one of our oldest connector types dating back to the uh, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, the Japanese numbering on the connector is different. Their homegrown Jones connector is numbered differently than the generic U.S. British type Jones connector. And this caused a lot of trouble. Uh, there was a lot of smoke, a lot of explosions, and a lot of bad language that occurred as people figured out that there were two numbering systems on that connector. Let's look at some of the different cables that you might have or not have with the transceiver you got. So here's the Jones plug with the crusty lamp cord. This is the typical uh, homebrew version of the cord. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's just a rubber lamp cord with a very interesting uh, connector on the end. I wonder if there's fuses inside that. That's pretty cool. Here's another one. This one looks probably like it's uh, right from the factory. Pretty cool looking. It's got this strain relief on it and uh, it's got these weird wings. Okay. And then uh, here's the DC version. This is how you put the Yesu on a battery or put it in your car. So this looks like another original cord that came with the set. Very lucky to get these with your set, by the way. Uh, generally, you're going to go out and you're going to find a Jones connector and you're going to try to put a cord on there. So, uh, oh, I should finish it off. Here's what you should do. Look at this. We have a right angle Jones. We have a, uh, a ferrite bead on the cord. That's not to protect the transceiver, by the way. That's just a little thing to protect the transceiver from getting into other things in your house. And this is a nice number 14 three-wire cord, a proper cord. That's where you want to go, guys. You want a nice cord for your transceiver, not a crusty lamp cord. Now, finally, there's another connector on the uh, back of the transceiver, and that's this uh, multi-pin connector that uh, has all kinds of features and accessories and, and so on. But there's one on there that uh, shorts two pins together that allows the transmitter to actually function. Uh, so you're going to need one of these guys as well. So I just thought I'd start with the cords because uh, this can trip you up pretty quick. But Follow the advice of uh, it doesn't work. Guess what? The transceiver does not work. That's the best policy. I just bought a transceiver that's used repairable. I don't care if the guy said it works perfectly. At this age, you can't trust anything in these transceivers. So anyway, this is the opening. Uh, we're going to be looking inside next. I hope you enjoy this series on the FT-101, the classic Yesu transceiver. This is an early version. When I get the case off, maybe we'll see a real serial number on the side of this radio, and we'll be able to decide exactly what its pedigree is. So I do want to say that, in general, this transceiver is in pretty good shape. If this transceiver had been put in a place where there was high humidity, then you would see a lot of damage. And 
uh, before we even think about the boards, we need to take it out of the case so we can do closer inspection and then gently get the boards out so we can do some work with them. But I'm not seeing too much surface corrosion, mostly just dirt and dust. That's a good sign. Now, that doesn't mean that no aging has occurred. Certainly, there's aging that's occurred. But this is in much better shape than many radios from this era. So I'm just going to get, you know, the, the screws out. We'll take this thing out of the case. Looks like we have some hex heads. Now you see the scratch marks here? These indicate the social security number of the person who owned the radio. It was very common to put that number in your radio to keep it from being stolen. You guys that remember this era of scratching in your uh, social, maybe you could enlighten me as to what's going on. The other thing, you see these two here? I have a feeling, just like on the, uh, the Kenwood, these two need to be removed. So on the Kenwood I did uh, about a year and a half ago, these two guys were specifically around the power amplifier cage to provide uh, improved shielding and connection to the uh, outer case. Okay. Okay. See some dust and dirt, but boy, that looks pretty good. Just looking to see if anything's been tampered with. We have a little spider web here. Boy, I don't know. I think this guy is pretty virginal. It's looking pretty good. Nothing is jumping out at me that, uh, you know, somebody's been in there and modified anything. It looks like it's original. So it certainly acts like it just wants to come right off. Well, there you go. And these handles are available. Replacement handles are available readily. That's not a big deal. It's still... The steel part's still intact, but of course the, the faux leather has uh, disintegrated. There should be a serial number showing up on this side. Okay, there's our serial number, 119374. So I'm not seeing signs of surface corrosion. I mean, I went over it with, you know, some multi-purpose cleaner. Okay, the 101 is now on the bench. So, you know, I want to try to get in there and clean things as best I can, which means uh, cards need to be removed. The final cage needs to be opened. The tubes need to be removed and cleaned up and tested. Now, I'll just use a, a simple tester on the tubes. I know that's not the real thing, but at least it'll tell if the tubes still have a mission at all. You know, I'm missing a knob. You can see I'm missing a knob. And I was thinking, what can I do to get a knob on there so I can test this thing? But, you know, this is, <laughs> this will work. And uh, I could put this knob on there, you know, and temporarily get away with it. But I looked at my junk box and I found this knob. That's a nice knob but unfortunately it's the wrong size inside. But just when all hope was lost, I had one of my uh, subscribers that lives nearby give me an email and said, hey Mike, um, how would you like to have possession of a parts car that you could rip parts off? Oh, yes I would. This is an FT-101 Echo. Uh, the E, of course, came uh, several years later than the FT-101, but still, there's going to be some parts on this that uh, I might need. And especially, we're talking about the knob. So that solved the knob problem right off the bat. I can refer to this radio when looking at the bottom. Possibly I might need the relay or some other part out of this radio. So it's always nice to have a parts car available for your work on the uh, rig you're trying to bring back. These are online, by the way, but uh, having the physical manuals in your hands helps so much right on the bench. So some of you will love this and some of you will hate this, but 
I would like to go through the frequency plan on the FT-101. The transceiver basically is a dual conversion super heterodyne type and this is uh, was made famous by the Collins KWM-2. They're using the same system here in the FT-101. The receive signals are using the dotted lines. The transmit signals are using the solid lines. And of course back here I have the you know, the IF amplifier with the filters and the balance modulator, the product detector, all that stuff's over here in a box. And we know that goes both ways in and out of that module. So we're just going to keep that off the side. So when you're talking about a frequency plan, you're trying to minimize spurs and you're trying to cover as much of the 3.5 to 30 megahertz band as possible. So starting at the antenna, we go through the relay on the receive path this direction and then we go through the preselector through the preselector and down into the first mixer this first mixer in the Collins system uses crystal oscillator bank to set your actual bands and since we're only tuning 500 kilohertz bands uh, for 10 meters for instance you'd need four crystals to cover the entire band so out of that first mixer, and we've just converted 3.5 to 30 megahertz, picking one of those bands, we're going to turn it into a tunable frequency between 5.52 and 6.02 megahertz. That's a 500 kilohertz tuning band. We send that through a fixed bandpass filter, and then it comes down into the second mixer. This is the receiver's second mixer. This is serviced by the VFO, which is high side injection, and you end up with a fixed IF of 3.182 megahertz that we send over to the uh, filters and the uh, product detector. So the crystal oscillator is high side injection, and the VFO is high side injection. That's the receive channel. Let's go the other way. Let's transmit. We come out with uh, balance modulation that's been filtered by the sideband filter, so we have single sideband. We send that into the first transmitter mixer, which is serviced by the VFO, and we get a resulting tuning band of 5.52 to 6.02 megahertz. We send that through the same fixed bandpass filter, and then over into the second transmit mixer. This guy also is being handled by the crystal oscillator bank with high side injection. The resulting output is on frequency. We send that on frequency signal through that same preselector that we used on the receiver. And then it goes right into the driver, into the power amplifier, and of course through the, the loading filter, the, uh, the PA uh, filter, which I didn't really consider, and out to the antenna. So that's the frequency plan for the FT-101. So here are the various printed wiring board assemblies. Many of these assemblies have both transmit and receive functions on board, so there's a lot of double duty being done here. Remember, the Yesu FD-101 is basically a Collins clone. Uh, it's a traditional dual conversion super heterodyne architecture. So there are small keepout segments where you can't tune in the shortwave range between 3.5 and 30 megahertz. Specifically, uh, 2 to 3.5 megahertz and 5.5 to 7 megahertz are illegal bands because they're basically at the IF frequencies. But you can do a lot of work uh, with this transceiver outside of the common five bands. Uh, you can do Mars frequencies. And uh, for instance, you could do the 30 meter band, 17 meters, 12 meters, CB mid and free band. And, uh, you know, it would involve, you know, working with the, uh, the transceiver crystalline. You'd have to do some rewiring and some retuning. But uh, you can operate outside the bands quite easily with this architecture. There's also an RF noise blanker and speech compressor circuit. These were continuously improved over the life of the FT-101's model run. This is one of the last true analog radios. It has all the familiar feels of a nice analog radio. Now, let's look at construction 
First of all, I have to say that Yesu's decision to use computer card plug-in modules was very radical for a piece of amateur gear. But the idea of quick access for repair was out there for early computers in the form of these board sockets. Motorola had just introduced a new idea in TV in 1969 called Works in a Drawer. The idea was to allow the TV repairman to just pull out a drawer on the front of the TV and the electronic guts would all be accessible. He would bring some replaceable boards and just uh, pop one in with the replaceable uh, connectors. This seemed like a good idea. But along with such capability came extra engineering. That means upfront costs, practical limitations on the design layout, and performance and isolation issues. With the ASUS modules, the quality of the card fingers, the plating and the sockets and so on, could potentially affect the long-term reliability of the transceiver. As this is my first time looking at the layout, I think we can say they did a pretty good job. Anyone that's uh, been into recapping some old 1960s transceivers, these point-to-point -point style transceivers sometimes are a bird's nest with hard-to-reach parts, and you can certainly relate to easy-to-fix printed circuit boards. But there's still folks in the 21st century who simply fear working on printed circuit boards altogether. So let's look at a couple of the modules. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the actual module out of the radio I have. Notice it has a single sideband filter installed, but it doesn't have the CW filter. Perhaps I can steal the CW filter off the parts car. This capacitor has a little bit of a split occurring on it, and this mylar is going to be replaced. Other than that, this card, I think, is going to go right straight back in. As you can see, here's the... Uh, Here's the top of my transceiver with all of the, uh, the printed wiring boards pretty well identified. I looked at the crystal bank. It does not have the crystal for the 11 meter band. It does seem to have the WWV crystal. So I'm looking forward to trying to get this thing to work on WWV. Here's the second module out of my unit. And in this one, you can start to see some of the damage on some of the Mylar caps. But you know what? They probably still work enough that I would dare to put this in the set and try to power it up. So I will be replacing some capacitors on this, but you know, for a, a startup, I think it's going to be just fine with this model.